So like all good stories, this starts a long, long time ago when there was basically nothing. So here is a complete picture of the universe about 14 odd billion years ago. All energy is concentrated into a single point of energy. For some reason it explodes and you begin to get these things. So you're now about 14 billion years into this. And these things expand and expand and expand into these giant galaxies and you get trillions of them. And within these galaxies you get these enormous dust clouds and I want you to pay particular attention to the three little prongs in the center of this picture. If you take a close-up of those, they look like this. And what you're looking at is columns of dust where there's so much dust, by the way, the scale of this is a trillion vertical miles, and what's happening is there's so much dust, it comes together and it fuses and ignites a thermonuclear reaction. And so what you're watching is the birth of stars. These are stars being born out of here. When enough stars come out, they create a galaxy. This one happens to be a particularly important galaxy because you are here. <laughs> and as you take a close-up of this galaxy, you find a relatively normal, not particularly interesting star. By the way, you're now about two-thirds of the way into this story. So this star doesn't even appear until about two-thirds of the way into this story. And then what happens is there's enough dust left over that it doesn't ignite into a star, it becomes a planet. And this is about a little over four billion years ago. And soon thereafter, there's enough material left over that you get a primordial soup, <laughs> and that creates life. And life starts to expand and expand and expand until it goes kaput. Now, the really strange thing is life goes kaput not once, not twice, but five times. So almost all life on Earth is wiped out about five times. And as you're thinking about that, what happens is you get more and more complexity, more and more stuff to build new things with. And we don't appear until about 99.96% of the time into this story. Just to put ourselves and our ancestors in perspective. So within that context, there's two theories of the case as to why we're all here. The first theory of the case is that's all she wrote. Right? Under that theory, we are the be-all and end-all of all creation. And the reason for trillions of galaxies, sextillions of planets, is to create something that looks like that <laughs> and something that looks like that. And that's the purpose of the universe, and then it flatlines. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> the only question you might want to ask yourself is, could that be just mildly arrogant? And if it is, and particularly given the fact that we came very close to extinction, there were only about 2,000 of our species left, a few more weeks without rain, we would have never seen any of these. <laughs> so maybe you have to think about a second theory, if the first one isn't good enough. The second theory is, could we upgrade? Well. Why would one ask a question like that? Because there have been at least 29 upgrades so far of humanoids. So it turns out that we have upgraded, and we've upgraded time and again and again. And it turns out that we keep discovering upgrades. We found this one last year. We found another one last month. And as you're thinking about this, you might also ask the question, so why a single human species? Wouldn't it be really odd if you went to Africa and Asia and Antarctica and found exactly the same bird? Particularly given that we coexisted at the same time with at least eight other versions of humanoid at the same time on this planet. 
So the normal state of affairs is not to have just a Homo sapiens. The normal state of affairs is to have various versions of humans walking around. And if that is the normal state of affairs, then you might ask yourself, all right, so if we wanted to create something else, how big does a mutation have to be? Well, Svante Pavo has the answer. The difference between humans and Neanderthal is 0.004% of gene code. That's how big the difference is one species to another. This explains most contemporary political debates. <laughs> but as you're thinking about this, one of the interesting things is how small these mutations are and where they take place. Difference human Neanderthal is sperm and testes, smell and skin, and those are the specific genes that differ from one to the other. So very small changes can have a big impact. And as you're thinking about this, we're continuing to mutate. So about 10,000 years ago, by the Black Sea, we had one mutation in one gene, which led to blue eyes. And this is continuing and continuing and continuing. And as it continues, one of the things that's going to happen this year is we're going to discover the first 10,000 human genomes because it's gotten cheap enough to do the gene sequencing. And when we find these, we may find differences. And by the way, this is not a debate that we're ready for because we have really misused the science in this. In the 1920s, we thought there were major differences between people. That was partly based on Francis Galton's work. He was Darwin's cousin. But the US, the Carnegie Institute, Stanford, or the American Neurological Association took this really far. That got exported and was really misused. In fact, it led to some absolutely horrendous treatment of human beings. So since the 1940s, we've been saying there are no differences. We are all identical. We're going to know at year end if that is true. And as we think about that, we're actually beginning to find things like, do you have an ACE gene? Why would that matter? Because nobody's ever climbed an 8,000 meter peak without oxygen that doesn't have an ACE gene. And if you want to get more specific, how about a 577R genotype? Well, it turns out that every male Olympic power athlete ever tested carries at least one of these variants. If that is true, it leads to some very complicated questions for the London Olympics. Three options. Do you want the Olympics to be a showcase for really hardworking mutants? <laughs> Option number two. Why don't we play it like golf or sailing? Because you have one and you don't have one, I'll give you a tenth of a second head start. Version number three, because this is a naturally occurring gene and you've got it and you didn't pick the right parents, you get the right to upgrade.